Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, the 8th of February. I'm Kate Andrews, the Spectator's Economics Editor and your host this week. Coming up on the show? Westminster is no stranger to a plot, especially one to oust a Prime Minister. Now it's Rishi Sunak's turn. Why now and will it succeed? Katie Balls has the story alongside the woman who wrote about plots months ago, Nadine Dorries. Brits are being signed off work with long-term sickness at a higher rate than ever before. Is COVID the only thing to blame? How can we get people back into the workforce? Our data editor, Michael Simmons, and Universal Credit architect, Ann Duncan Smith, join me on the show. Over in France, can Eric Zemmour reclaim support from the populist right? Freddie Gray has been speaking to him for the magazine this week. We'll show you a clip from that interview. Two years on, Russia's war in Ukraine shows no signs of stopping. But is Ukraine's tactic to send older soldiers to the front line working? Svetlana Mornets and historian Anthony Beaver join me on the show. And finally, are men any good at being feminists? Zoe Strimple has taken a look back at the author Thomas Hardy, who wrote beautifully about women. But did his stories match his actions? She joins me on the show. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. First up, should Rishi Sunak be worried about the plot to oust him from number 10? Writing the cover piece this week, Katie Ball says the plotters are focused on the next 100 days as a general election gets closer. Someone else who has written about the plot is Nadine Dorries, former minister and Tory MP. Initially, she was ridiculed for her thesis, and she's got some thoughts on that now as her and Katie join me on the show. Katie, in this week's magazine, you write about the plot to oust Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. What is going on? So we often hear about plotting in Westminster, um, particularly in recent years, moves against uh, Tory prime ministers. And I think there's a difference between Tory MPs telling you how miserable they are, how they're thinking about writing a letter, and what is currently happening. Um, because we've had over the past couple of weeks a few things where it's, uh, whether it's you know, a mysteriously funded poll in the Telegraph, whether it's um, talk of former government advisors working um, to try to oust Rishi Sunak. And I think, although it's a pretty loose group, what has become apparent is there is a cabal effectively of disgruntled Tories who would like to move against Rishi Sunak before the next election. And I think a few months ago, the sense was, oh, that, that contest and that fight is for after the election. And the question is, can this quite small group, and we know, you know, uh, some, some are anonymous donors, some are former government aides, we know a few names to do with it, in the sense David Frost was linked to this poll, but I think has since tried to distance himself a bit. We know that Rishi Sunak's former pollster, Will Dry, is now working with some of this group. Um, and can they together between now and I think their deadline, which is around the time of the local elections in May, manage to get enough MPs on board? It seems quite difficult right now, but what is striking is the fact there is money behind it and people with a lot of time on their hands. Katie, how seriously should we take this plot? As you mentioned there, there's money behind it, there's serious people behind it. But at the same time, you had Liz Truss's former minister, Simon Clark, calling for the prime minister to go just last week. And that was pushed back on. There's been very little public support, especially within the Tory party, for him doing so. So how much appetite is there really? How much momentum is there to oust Rishi Sunak? So I think right now this is a plot that is largely taking place outside of Parliament. There are more Tory MPs than just Simon Clark who privately will say they don't think Rishi Sunak's very good, they think if the polling is this bad perhaps you should roll the dice. But they're a really small number, lots of people are scarred from the fact that they you know, got rid of two leaders in the space of two years and the polling has really gone in the wrong direction since. But I think the reason that it is something to note is just the fact that there is this movement and there are, uh, you know, if you look around, things are not looking very good for Rishi Sunak. You have difficult by-elections next week. You've got the local elections in May. So therefore, if you're judging it on whether they will be able to oust Rishi Sunak, I think most people tell you that seems pretty far-fetched right now. No one's jumping in. But then again, they don't actually have to succeed to cause Rishi Sunak some serious problems. Nadine, you'll recognise the... Uh, title of Katie's cover this week, The Plot. It was inspired by your book cover, uh, The Plot. Uh, as Katie mentions in the piece, you were writing some time ago about plots to oust Boris Johnson. Do you see familiarities between what you were writing about then and what's happening now? 
Well, I actually wrote in my book, The Plot, that Rishi Sunak would go through exactly the same problems that Boris Johnson had and that they would try to remove him fairly soon too. In fact, I went to both my agent and my publishers in December 2022, when Rishi Sunak had only been Prime Minister for three months and said he's got a very short time before they start moving to get him out as well. And um, and yeah, and it's predicted along with lots of other things in the book. So the, and the reason why I know this is because the people who were behind putting Rishi Sunak into place in the first place, the people who were behind removing Boris Johnson, Annie and Duncan Smith and Theresa May, and actually via a technical process, forcing David Cameron into a position where he had to resign, those same people put Rishi Sunak in place and they do this because they're desperate to remain in power because they have this really unique role at the heart of government. Unidentified for over 20 years and and most of the most them people won't even know. I mean, Michael Gove, everybody knows. Dominic Cummings, people now know, but he's been around since 2001. Dougie Smith, people now know because of the plot and he's been outed through the plot. And it was reported only a couple of weeks ago, I think, that Dougie Smith was advising the plotters. And the reason why he's moved from the person he put into power, who was Rishi Sunak, onto Kemi Badenoch is because they desperately need to keep inside number 10 and inside Westminster. And they see it all disappearing in front of their eyes now that they're 20 points. Basically, they got it wrong. By plotting to remove Boris Johnson and getting rid of Boris Johnson, they, they got it so wrong and they expected to be in a different place to where they are now, which is why you will see ever increasingly desperate attempts to smear Rishi Sunak in an attempt to force MPs to move like a herd, as they did against Boris Johnson, to get their letters into Graham Brady and to remove him. And you will see constant, constant praise, constant applause, constant presentation of, of Kemi Badenoch as the replacement for Rishi Sunak. And that will continue until they remove him. And I'll just give you a date, kind of like how they will work this. They, they wanted Boris Johnson out before Parliament rose for the summer recess in the July of 2022. And they achieved that. And they will be looking for a key milestone with Rishi Sunak. They'll be looking either for the May elections or for Easter. I can't believe they will go as far as July, but they will, they will, as you've seen reported in the media, be by cut by cut, by a process of attrition, constantly putting out negative news stories about Rishi Sunak until they get to the point where they can get him out. And what will be driving them on is that they will say Boris Johnson turned it around in six months and they think Kemi Badenoch will be able to do the same. Katie, in your cover, you have some of the details that the plotters are thinking about for their timeline. Can you talk us through those? And also to Nadine's point there about turning things around, you write in your piece that the assumption um, that Rishi Sunak supporters made was that there would be time to get the polls into a better place. Actually, things got worse. Will the plotters be thinking the same thing, that it's only going to take a change of leader to see things improve? Yes, yeah, so I think in terms of the timeline on this, um, I think that it's probably seen through a few events that they can use to destabilise Rishi Sunak. And one is next week um, when you have two by-elections. Um, I think speaking to some in government, there is a sense that next week could be one of the worst weeks yet for Rishi Sunak, which is probably saying something given he's had some pretty bad weeks. Um, in the sense, you're going to have inflation figures. I think inflation will not be going the way they want it to. You're going to have figures on growth that could show the UK has been in a recession. And then you could top that all off on the Friday by losing two Tory seats. Now, number 10 will turn around and say, these seats are really hard to win. One was sparked by Chris Skidmore as a completely unnecessary by-election, given the seat's going to go any anyway at the next election. He just didn't want to stick it out. Um, the other, Peter Bone, uh, clearly was a, uh, is a very difficult by-election. You think at the terms he had to uh, you know, lose a whip and so forth and had his punishment for. Um, and then, so I think they'll be looking at the reform vote there to try and say, if reform does well, look, we need to move more to the right. Look, this isn't working the current strategy then I think you'll start to have more 
potentially on just a general uh, focus on boats. Is Rishi Sunak's policy going to work? And then I think building up to the local elections when you will start to potentially have a bit of a a horror result in the sense the last time the local elections in terms of these councils were contested was a high point of the Boris Johnson premiership. I think in return, the Tories will be trying to focus minds on the budget and trying to say you know, more tax cuts are coming, stick with our plan and, and trying to kick in some loyalty that way. Um, so, so it builds up to there. And I think even the plotters, and again, they're not just one group, but you speak to different figures who want to ask Rishi Sunak, nearly all will concede that they don't think you can go to Nadine's point much later than May. They see the two weeks after the May local elections as the time one would have to act. I spoke to one who said, you know, if, if the MPs don't go for it by that point, they will happily retire and leave them to it. Let's see if that happens. Um, but that gives you a sense of the times. And then I think in terms of... If you want to understand the logic of those pushing for a new leader, um, they would argue, I think the argument is, um, if you, the party is probably heading to defeat regardless, but the scale of defeat is very important in terms of rebuilding the party after how long you stay in opposition. And they think the don't know voters are largely leave voters, the 2019 voters, and the current uh, situation and Rishi Sunak is not going to have that appeal. The best thing to do is get a new leader, new leader TBC, um, who then hits the ground running with a week of these uh, big announcements, particularly those on immigration, and makes a new impression on the public and it goes from there. Now, of course, this is all a little bit fantastical in the sense, are there really, you know, four really good news announcements to do that would fix the Tory party's fortunes? I think that might be um, a little bit wishful thinking, but that is, I think, how they would start to think you move to a new leader who can then make a fresh impression, particularly on Leave voters, where they think that Rishi Sunak has, you know, seen his popularity fall quite a lot. So um, Katie mentioned May, the Wellingborough by-election is going to be a, a seismic moment and it will depend very much on how, what reform poll in that election. I mean, I, I can't see them winning it, but, you know, Ben Habib, who's the reform candidate, everybody knows his name. And if reform poll more than 13, 14, 15 percent, I think you'll see the um, Conservative Party go into what is almost a nervous breakdown point. And I think uh, Rishi Sunak, if reform did really well in that election, would really struggle to survive past that day. You know, the one thing that both Boris Johnson and David Cameron did do, and George Osborne did do when they were in power, was they always had an eye to what was UKIP, then reform, and to the left. And they constantly positioned policies to make sure that they had stakes in those ground. Rishi Sunak has abandoned the left by abandoning environmental policies and others, and he's abandoned the right too with the Windsor Framework Agreement and immigration. And so he's in a very narrow place in terms of policy ground. And I think he'll find it very difficult to survive Wellingborough if, if reform do well. And, you know, Katie, you talked about tax cuts. Those tax cuts aren't coming in any way. It's not just immigration, it's immigration and tax cuts. It's actually about conservatism. And the, the, we know the tax cuts. There's already been this kind of like um, expectation management of, oh, we said there was going to be tax cuts to calm everybody down. Actually, there aren't going to be tax cuts, possibly because of a demand for increase in defence spending. So there's not going to be those tax cuts. And we... You know, the the Rwanda bill, are we going to see the planes take off? And, you know, how many how many illegal immigrants are we going to see being returned or sent over to Rwanda? But that's not going to make any huge impact, is it? And the fact that, you know, Rishi Sunak very this week has made three massive gaps, you know, shaking hands with Piers Morgan. I mean, what what a performance by Piers Morgan. But, you know, for any prime minister with any integrity or dignity, to shake hands with a thousand pounds bet over the lives of people who travelled across dangerous waters to get here was just completely tactless. And also, you know, hugging uh, in Northern Ireland with Sinn Féin is just, it's um, his, and, you know, today at Prime Minister's Questions, when the mother of Brianna Gee was sat in the public gallery, it's just gaff after gaff. And the one thing I remember Boris Johnson saying to me at the time Liz Truss went, and there was that meeting between Penny Morden to Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson about who should take over. The only person who actually had the mandate to take over was Boris Johnson. And I think Boris said to me at that time that he looked Rishi in the eye and they said, what they've done to me, they'll do to you too. And I think it was the only point at which Rishi Sunak froze and um, looked that his confidence was dented. 
you may think rationally that the right policy announcements are what will bring the party together. That won't be what gets rid of Rishi Sunak. What will remove Rishi Sunak are some serious, I would imagine, pieces of information that those who've been close to him for the last seven or eight years, who actually put him into power, will decide to use against him in the near future. Katie, is number 10 worried about the plots that are uh, being whipped up to remove the prime minister? And Nadine earlier mentioned potential runners and riders, Kemi Badnock being one of them. Uh, the trade secretary has publicly suggested that she has uh, no interest in replacing the prime minister anytime soon, that she backs Rishi Sunak. But what will they be thinking inside number 10 as these details, as your cover piece um, uh, uh, includes, come to light? So I think the view of number 10 is they're not nonchalant. I mean, they're trying not to suggest they're overly worried in the sense, oh, it's an amateur hour plot. Look at these people going around claiming they're going to bring down the prime minister. And I think there's been an effort to almost try and, um, you know, we've seen some names come out. I think there's a view of trying to find out who the donors are. It's harder to hide in, you know, daylight than nighttime. Um, but I think there is definitely some alarm because it's not just about a handful of MPs. Um, to Nadine's point, it feels as though, you know, there's different forces in the background. There's obviously people who, who want to throw some money at this and so forth. And it doesn't actually take that much money. If you think about the price of a poll, like the MRP poll that the Telegraph ran um, by the mysterious alliance, a couple of £10,000, which on the grand scheme of things, I don't mean this is about doing a £1,000 bet, but probably for that level of money and for the level of disruption it caused to the Tory party and the dominant force in politics, I mean, it doesn't take that much to start using these figures to do things like that. So I think there is concern. I don't think there is panic. Um, I just think there is a sense that they may not, I think the view is more, they're unlikely to be able to oust Sunak, that's the view from number 10, um, but they can do plenty of harm in the process. And then I think to the point of uh, successes, whether it's list side or after an election, it is names like Kemi Bade, not Penny Morden, who do come up. If you had a very swift contest, you need about over 100 names really to get to that point. Um, so I think that even those who are perhaps supportive of Suella Braverman in theory, they would um, probably think that she would struggle to get the required number. Uh, Nadine, last question. I was looking at some of the reviews of your book, The Plot, when it came out uh, just before we started to record. Um, and I, I won't list some of the things that were said. There's no need. But there's a lot of skepticism, let's say, and criticism of some of the ideas you put forward in that book, mainly around this idea of a plot and this idea of conspiracy. What is your reaction now? So yeah, I expected the criticism because I was told before the book came out what the criticism was going to be, what the plotters, you know, I was told David Cameron and Michael Gove are going to say that you're, you know, you've sold three million books, you're a great fiction writer. And that, you know, that I knew the attacks would come in, you know, I'm a woman, I'm, you know, a, a different kind of conservative than people are used to. And I knew those attacks would come. But what I found absolutely fascinating is people who attack it are now running with stories from the book. So I find it really interesting that the same people who attack it are picking the bits of stories out of it that they want to run with and making their own stories from it. So, you know, it is what it is. It's sold incredibly well and, um, and, and it's selling consistently well every week, which is interesting because normally you get like a big, you know, a big sales and it, and it tails off. But it's actually selling consistently well every week. And I, and I just know from the feedback that I'm getting, just not just from journalists, but from from party members, from just the public who are reading it, the feedback I get is tends to boil down to it all makes sense. And it does all make sense. And I just want to make one final point, you know, those people who who worked with Rishi Sunak to get him into power have been working with Kemi Badenoch for an equally long period of time because they always have an hour and a spare. They never don't have somebody in reserve. So, and the idea to them that it would be Penny Morden would be absolutely abhorrent. And they will only go when they know they can get Kemi into place and the danger of Penny has passed. Well, perhaps we won't need the film version of the plot if we see it play out in real time. Nadine and Katie, thank you so much for joining me. Brits are being signed off work with long-term sickness at a higher rate than ever before. Is COVID the only thing to blame? How can we get people back into the workforce? Our data editor, Michael Simmons, and Universal Credit architect, Ann Duncan-Smith, join me on the show.
Michael, you write this week about revisions to the labour force survey and how it reveals just how large Britain's sick note has become. Talk us through it. So the labour force survey is one of the, the kind of key tools that the Office of National Statistics use to make important estimates about the country's workforce. So the employment rate, unemployment, economic activity um, and things like that. And last autumn, the ONS basically had to abandon publishing it because the data was becoming more and more unreliable because the response rates were going low, uh, were going down. There were certain biases in the survey that uh, meant statisticians didn't have um, confidence in the findings anymore. And basically this week, they've released part one of their sort of revisions to the methodology. And this revision was all about the population under underlying it. So basically what they found is that Britain's population and working age population is bigger, um, but it's also a lot sicker than they had previously thought. So originally we had thought that there were uh, 2.6 million British workers who were off work because of long-term illness. And that already was a, a record high. But what the new estimates have found that it was actually undercounting by 200,000. So we're now at 2.8 million, which obviously again is a record high. And this is, you know, obviously not what the government wants and not what our economy needs to kind of get going. Uh, Ian, this is disastrous. Well, there's a difference between out of work and people who are beyond the world of work, mm -hmm. which is a debate here at the moment. Uh, when I was Secretary of State, we put in changes not least of which was universal credit. And we saw work, numbers of workless households fall to record low numbers. Uh, and that was about the time I left in 2016 when I resigned. Uh, it was all going in the right direction and we were getting control over that. There's always been an issue about sickness benefit, but it has exploded as, uh, during COVID. Uh, what happened during COVID, I think two or three things. First of all, um, in reaction uh, to the likelihood of people's lost jobs. The government stepped in. It eased off all of the uh, criteria uh, for sanctions if somebody refuses to take a job or uh, deliberately uh, misses an interview or something to make sure people do what they're supposed to do as part of their contract when they uh, become unemployed. All those <coughs> strictures were eased off for good reasons I can understand and huge amounts of money were pumped into the system. Post-COVID, what we saw was basically uh, a real explosion uh, in the numbers of people who are try staying permanently on sickness benefit particularly. And there are two features to this which are really important, which the government could do, uh, and I've been urging them to do this. The first thing is sickness benefit, uh, the ESA, uh, Employment Support Allowance, was introduced by the Labour Party, was always faulty. Uh, because it's got, um, it's meant to have one section that allows you to go to work, but in fact, everybody ignores that and ends up getting tugged into the top section, which says no work requirements. And so that's meant to be in universal credit, but there's a whole cohort of people who should be in universal credit where they would receive help and assistance from jobs coaches to get them into work. Uh, and this would be really, really important. But instead of which, they languish. No one sees them. Once you go on to sickness benefit, you pretty much don't see anybody else for a long period of time. And nobody certainly talks to you about work. And that's the difference. That's why we wanted it in uh, universal credit, which has been really good at reducing workless households. And so, number one, they have to do that. Now, that's going to cost them some money, but it would certainly bear fruit. And in that group, that cohort that we're talking about, Something like 60% of those who now fall into the sickness benefit category are mental health issues. Mm. And of those, interestingly enough, about 60% have depression or anxiety. Now, these are very treatable conditions, very treatable. You know, you can turn people around and get them back into work much quicker on those two conditions through talking therapies, etc. The problem again, NHS doesn't have enough people to do that. Uh, and therefore, we need to look into the third sector, which is doing a lot of this anyway, uh, to get that back. But, you know, we've been a bit slow getting on top of this because that group, that cohort could be turned around quite quickly, I think, should we apply the right people to help them get through and back into work. Michael, Ian listed several things there that's contributing to those who are on long term sick, COVID, furlough. NHS waiting lists, mental health issues. Do you agree broadly that those are the categories that we're looking at? Obviously, they all in, uh, overlap in many ways as well. Yeah, and um, 
Ian's completely right. You know, there's there's been a huge COVID effect here. Um, apart from the the mental health problems, the other sort of big category is what they call musculoskeletal, so basically bad backs, and that seems to have specifically exploded um, after COVID as well. Um, and there needs to be some more research to kind of understand this. And it's hard to escape the idea that maybe working from home has something to play in that. Um, but also, I think working from home, there's another side to it that. A lot of people who from health conditions would previously been completely excluded from work now can be helped back into work where there is more flexible working. So I think that as well as saying, you know, the lockdowns and the pandemic caused huge damage to our workforce and wider society, there are aspects of it that we can say maybe can become part of the solution as well. Mm. And you you mentioned that you think a a big issue is that post-COVID, the government has not got a grip on the number of people leaving the workforce or taking long periods of time out of the workforce. But there were concerns and criticisms of universal credit long before the pandemic hit. One of them is that it's never been properly invested in. I think one of the pro-UC arguments has been, well, you're not getting all the results you want because you haven't actually seen the proper investment. Do you think that universal credit is fit for purpose? Do you think it has been properly invested in? Or do you think we need to look at the system now, especially post-COVID, and consider another overhaul? No. Uh, Let me tell you, I put that through. It is the single biggest uh, welfare reform uh, that we've undertaken. It's the only serious, huge digital program in any of the governments that you see. And other governments are looking at universal credit. It's perfectly fit for purpose. The question really is, what do you want to use it for? Uh, It's infinitely flexible. If you think about COVID, uh, when all those people suddenly became, as it were, underemployed, unemployed, they'd have been queuing up outside job centres, all catching COVID. Uh, They'd have been in chaos in the job centres, unable to cope with this. Universal Credit took a million people who had become unemployed into the benefit literally within three weeks. That's never been done before. So it's infinitely flexible. It is exactly the right benefit. It's the most flexible one that can actually approach this problem. The problem we've got is still the sickness benefit group that you are talking about is not wholly in universal credit. And it should have been. So the underinvestment problem is that they should have put the money into putting it in. That was the whole ambition of universal credit, was that then job centres, job advisors can get alongside these people that have got problems, mental health problems particularly, and start finding pathways into work for them that keep them out of the sickness benefit uh, end of things. And we invested money in having the right sort of coaches for that. But what you do need is backup. So what should happen is they would go there, they'd be registered, they'd be told this is their condition. They should then be entered into, depending on what the condition, things like talking therapies. These can all be done even from job centers, believe it or not. So there's lots that could be done through this. Universal credit is a tool. It depends on how the government wants to use it. It's an infinitely flexible tool. Uh, Right now, what it's doing is it was spending huge sums of money during COVID because that was what they wanted it to do. They should now be bringing back many of those changes, which they are, to be fair to them. Universal support alongside it, which isolates those who have got real problems, starts them through process. There's a second problem with this sickness issue too, which rarely gets touched on. It's about employers. UK employers are amongst the worst in the world at dealing with uh, their employees who have problems, health problems. They have very rapidly let them just go down until they fall onto statutory sick pay. And from there, they then crash into ESA and done. But yet they've invested huge sums of money in them during the years. In Germany and other places, they're much better at trying to make sure that those people don't fall out of work. Uh, they work with mental health practitioners only to make sure their hours of work are lowered to the level they can cope with while they get treatment, mm. and then they build them back up again. So uh, we also need to make sure that British business supports the idea of not getting people falling into unemployment because it's damaging for them and the whole problem gets worse. So it's two-sided coin, this one is government's got to do more about this, and a very positive way of doing that is to invest in bringing uh, the sickness benefit under UC, which would be able to help enormously. And the second aspect is business also needs to work with government to try and find ways which they don't just dump people out of their businesses, out of their work uh, and into uh, into sickness benefit. And one final change that uh, would need to be done is that we need to bring in an in-work Uh, kind of conditionality too, which we originally planned, which is people have done maybe 15, 20 hours. A lot of people, there's a huge number of people that are sitting on part-time work, uh, still being subsidized by the UK, by the government, 
uh, because that part-time work doesn't pay enough. So number one, perhaps we should get employers to pay the working the proper rate. And the second thing is that we need to make sure that when they're ready, the work coaches can work to get them up the hours. So you start moving from 15 hours maybe to 25, then up to 30 and so on and so forth until they break three from the benefit system. That's the ambition of universal credit. It just requires us to make sure that's how we use it. And if there's a need for that conditionality, I think most people would understand when you're ready, it's time to move. And yet, Michael, it seems like something is still going badly wrong here. Do you think it's an issue of incentives? Are the in right incentives in place for people to be going back to work? I mean, the UK has a, still a pretty high number of job vacancies. It's not at its record high post-COVID, but it's well over 900,000. People want to be going back to work, they can, but we're speaking specifically about long-term sick workers who are off here. Interestingly, they're not all over 50. They're not people who are necessarily struggling from being in work for a long time. We've got people in their 20s and 30s who say they are too sick to go to work. Something feels very broken here. What do you think it is? Yeah, um, well, I think incentives is certainly part of the issue, but um, again, not to keep going back to lockdown, but I think something really changed in our sort of psyche during lockdown. And you see the same with school absences, where basically before before we experienced lockdowns, there was always, you know, you, you had to be, most people had to be pretty sick, pretty unwell before you wouldn't go to school, before you wouldn't go to work. And I think something has changed where we're sort of more accepting within ourselves um, about, you know, staying in and locking ourselves away. Um, and that's something that's going to be really complicated to address. But it's something, you know, we have to do. If you look at in internationally comparisons of workforce recoveries, we've got one of the worst, worst in the, uh, Europe, worst in the developed world. So it's something that needs to be looked at. On the issue of UC and in work, this is something that, you know, the government can be putting a lot more effort into tidying up and um, you know, making that system is really working streamlined. Uh, we've, you know, reported before about some problems we think there is with it in the technical system uh, that that handles the in-work payment part of UC um, that the DWP at the moment doesn't seem to be doing much to look at addressing that. So things like getting UC, which is, you know, a good and sensible system, but getting it working as perfectly as it can, can only help you know, get these people back into jobs. Michael and Ian, thanks for joining me. Some predict European elections will lead to victories for populists across the continent. Someone hoping to benefit from this is Eric Zemmour, a French TV commentator who's run for the presidency in France flopped two years ago. But he has a new party now, positioning himself to the right of Marine Le Pen and focusing on immigration in France. Our deputy editor, Freddie Gray, interviewed him for the magazine this week. Here's a clip of that interview. Et, mais en Angleterre, on est encore fier un peu. Uh, de notre modèle multiculturel. Vous pensez que ça aussi, c'est une, une suicide Ah, je pense que c'est un suicide. Je pense que, si vous voulez, vous savez, euh, on peut s'amuser un moment en se disant que les Anglais et les Français se sont tellement affrontés pendant mille ans qu'ils s'affrontent même sur la plus belle façon de mourir. Et que les Anglais disent, mais non, c'est mon modèle qui est le meilleur, le multiculturalisme, et les Français disent « mais non, c'est mon modèle, euh, l'assimilation devenue intégration qui est le meilleur ». En vérité, je vais vous dire, nos deux modèles ont échoué. D'accord. Nous sommes à égalité. Oui. Euh, alors revenons à, à, aux politiques du, du moment. Macron qui essaye de, de passer cette loi et les, les objections juridiques. Est-ce que vous parlez beaucoup de... Vous avez écrit beaucoup sur le, votre peur de l'humain euh, islamique euh, la, la loi de l'humain qui arrive en France. Euh, Est-ce que vous pensez que le, le, le pouvoir du juridique en France, en ce moment, dans une démocratie, ça va s'appliquer avec un système d'humain islamiste Je pense que euh, le, le pouvoir judiciaire et euh, la... Le pouvoir judiciaire permet la tyrannie des minorités qui permet l'installation de l'islamisation du pays. C'est-à-dire que comme le juge, par sa défense excessive euh, des droits de l'individu, fait le lit de l'islamisation du pays, puisqu'il interdit à l'État français euh, de se défendre contre cette immigration et donc contre l'islamisation du pays au nom des droits de l'homme 
et c'est d'ailleurs tout le paradoxe, que la civilisation islamique euh, ne respecte aucunement, puisque dans l'islam, euh, l'individu n'est pas considéré, il n'est que membre euh, d'une un, tribu, euh, d'une un, civilisation et soumis à Dieu. Vous savez, islam veut dire soumission. Mais vous êtes aussi euh, opposé à l'individualisme de euh, l'Ouest, l'Occident Pas du tout. Pas du tout. L'individu euh, est au contraire la grande invention de la civilisation occidentale et judéo-chrétienne, le mélange entre le christianisme et euh, la culture grecque qui a créé cet individu libre qui s'est peu à peu émancipé euh, de ses tuteurs euh, religieux. Euh, mais pas quel... du tout. Je mais pense quelque que c'est chose... la gloire de l'Occident. Mais quelque chose que vous critiquez beaucoup, c'est le wokisme. Ah non, mais ça n'a rien à voir. Mais c'est le... l'individualisme euh, hyper atrophié. Attendez, attendez, attendez. D'accord. Je, je, je pense que effectivement, euh, l'individualisme en Europe est devenu fou. Oui. Et que euh, il est, si vous voulez, euh, réutilisé et exploité par le wokisme, qui en fait une machine de guerre des minorités, des minorités raciales, des minorités sexuelles, contre l'homme blanc hétérosexuel. Euh, voilà où nous en sommes aujourd'hui. Donc l'inventeur de cet individu, euh, celui qui l'a accouché dans l'histoire, c'est-à-dire l'homme blanc hétérosexuel, euh, en tout cas l'homme blanc, euh, l'homme blanc occidental, euh, est devenu euh, la victime d'un individualisme poussé à l'extrême, devenu fou, qui n'est pas un véritable individu parce que L'individu dans le wokisme n'est euh, défini que par ses origines, par sa race, par son sexe, euh, et qu'il n'est absolument pas libre de s'émanciper de ces euh, racines-là. Euh, donc le wokisme, si vous voulez, est un racisme à l'envers, c'est tout. Et, et c'est un totalitarisme à l'envers. Et nous devons absolument combattre le wokisme, parce que le wokisme est l'arme absolue de l'islamisation. Il y a une alliance aujourd'hui entre le wokisme et l'islamisation de nos pays. Les deux sont alliés contre l'Occident, contre euh, le, 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 la civilisation occidentale, pour l'abattre. Ensuite, je ne donne pas cher du sort euh, des woke, euh, en particulier qu'ils soient euh, homosexuels ou femmes, quand on sait euh, comment euh, est résolu leur sort en terre d'islam. Oui. Mais ils s'en apercevront bien plus tard. Mais c'est pour ça qu'en Angleterre, on, on, ça, on, on voit ça pas très clairement, je pense. Euh, c est, c est cet argument, en France non plus. Mais, mais c'est un argument de l'alliance entre la gauche et l'islamisme. C'est dur à voir, je pense, pour les gens. Euh... Bah écoutez, en France, euh, ça a un nom. Il s'appelle Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Oui. Voilà. C'est lui qui a réussi, lors de la dernière présidentielle, euh, cette alliance entre une énorme majorité de musulmans et les woke et la jeunesse woke euh, il a fondé euh, un mouvement, le mouvement politique de l'islamo-gauchisme euh, et il compte bien être euh, au, en, force, en position de force lors des prochaines, de la prochaine élection présidentielle en 2027 grâce à la, à la démographie et vous, vous décrivez le, le problème, là. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut parler un peu sur le, votre proposé, vos solutions mmh. euh, Vous avez formé un parti politique, euh, la Réconte 4. Euh, ça, a, ça a raté à la dernière fois. Ça, ça, ça a fait assez fort pour la, la première élection. Mais pourquoi vous avez perdu cette élection Vous savez, on, on, on pourrait... Euh réfléchir longuement. Je l'ai fait, j'ai écrit un livre pour expliquer euh, les causes de cette élection, les, les, euh, comment cette élection s'était déroulée. Euh, d'abord, euh, avant de parler de défaite, je voudrais dire que ce fut d'abord une énorme victoire. Parce que pour un parti qui n'avait que quelques mois d'existence, avec un candidat qui n'avait jamais été à une élection, quelle qu'elle soit, face à des partis qui avaient 50 ans, 70 ans d'existence, qui, pour certains, avait gouverné la France pendant toute la Ve République. Je vous rappelle quand même que j'ai fait plus avec mes 7% que les deux candidats qui représentaient les deux partis qui ont gouverné la France depuis le Charles de Gaulle, euh, que ce soit le candidat du Parti Socialiste ou le candidat 
de LR, qui est l'héritier euh, du RPR, du parti euh, de, de Charles de Gaulle. Donc c'est vous dire qu'il euh, faut relativiser cet échec. Maintenant, les circonstances de la campagne ont fait que euh, la guerre en Ukraine a, a, a complètement euh, euh, bouleversé et, et, et bloqué cette campagne présidentielle et a changé le cours de cette campagne présidentielle. Mais si vous voulez, euh, revenons euh, à aujourd'hui, revenons à demain. Je pense que si vous voulez, euh, le positionnement que j'ai adopté, c'est-à-dire d'être contre l'islamisation de la France et de l'Europe, d'être pour une économie de marché avec une baisse des taxes, une baisse des impôts, pour être contre l'assistanat, pour être contre le wokisme, à la pointe du combat contre le wokisme, pour être pour une école du mérite et de l'excellence, je pense que ce positionnement, d'abord, est unique en France. Il n'y a aucun parti qui ne soit sur euh, tous ces thèmes à la fois. Et je pense que euh, le, ce sont les thèmes qui seront les plus porteurs dans le combat politique futur. Je pense qu'il y a, au sein du peuple français, majoritairement, un consensus pour lutter contre l'islamisation de notre pays, pour rétablir une école du mérite et de l'excellence, pour lutter contre les dérives wokistes et, et pour lutter contre l'assistanat et favoriser la baisse des taxes et des impôts. Je pense que ce, notre mouvement est à la pointe de ce que les Français veulent. Et si, si vous voulez... Euh, si ça n'a pas marché tout de suite, c'est simplement d'abord dû au fait qu'il y a, vous savez, comme en Angleterre, il euh, les, les, y a un effet euh, de, de marque, c'est-à-dire que les, les autres partis étaient beaucoup plus mieux ancrés, beaucoup plus mieux enracinés dans l'imaginaire de tous les Français, que par ailleurs, le mode de scrutin, vous connaissez évidemment les contraintes du mode de scrutin majoritaire à un tour, puisqu'il empêche l'émergence d'autres partis que les deux grands partis qui gouvernent le pays depuis, euh, depuis des siècles, depuis un siècle, euh, dans le scrutin majoritaire à deux tours, euh, c'est un peu les mêmes contraintes, c'est-à-dire que les nouveaux partis ont beaucoup plus de mal à émerger que dans le système proportionnel qui régit d'autres pays comme l'Italie ou euh, la Hollande, euh, comme on a vu récemment. Mais je pense que, si vous voulez, il y a un mouvement européen, un mouvement européen qui est exactement sur la même ligne que Reconquête, toute l'Europe est travaillée par ce même, ces mêmes euh, phénomènes idéologiques. La lutte contre l'islamisation, le retour du mérite, de l'autorité, de l'excellence à l'école, la lutte contre le wokisme et euh, le, 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 la baisse des impôts et des taxes. Je pense qu'il y a partout en Europe ce mouvement-là, on l'a vu dans les élections en Hollande, on l'a vu dans les élections en Suède, on l'a vu dans les élections au, pays, euh, en, en, au Danemark, pardon, on l'a vu en Italie, on l'a vu au Portugal. Vous savez, euh, l'Europe est un continent très particulier dans l'histoire de l'Europe où, à la fois, on n'a jamais réussi à, à, à laisser pérenniser de grands empires qui unifiaient le continent. Nous avons d'innombrables nations qui se sont opposées, affrontées et, di et, 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 et différenciées, mais en même temps, dans toute l'histoire du continent depuis mille ans, nous avons des, des grands phénomènes historiques, politiques, idéologiques, intellectuels, économiques même, qui se sont répandus à chaque fois dans toute l'Europe. On pourrait partir de la féodalité au IXe siècle euh, jusqu'à euh, euh, la Renaissance au XVe, les Lumières au XVIIIe, le, 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 les, 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 les révolutions euh, du XIXe siècle après la Révolution française et et, et on pourrait revenir plus près de nous, euh, au tachérisme euh, que vous avez lancé à la fin des années 70 euh, et qui s'est répandu dans toute l'Europe, y compris en France, où le gouvernement était pourtant socialiste. Euh, le populisme dans les années 2000, euh, que vous avez lancé aussi avec le Brexit et euh, la victoire de Trump. Et aujourd'hui, aujourd je pense que euh, nous avons un nouveau mouvement que je vous décrivais, c'est-à-dire essentiellement la conscience, la prise de conscience par les peuples européens qu'ils doivent lutter contre l'islamisation de leurs pays respectifs et qui est le grand mouvement unificateur de la politique européenne dans les années qui viennent.
In Ukraine, soldiers defending their country have not left the battlefield for the past two years. In Kyiv, a tough law is about to be brought in that would see conscription apply to younger recruits. This has started a public disagreement between President Zelensky and his army general Zeluzhny. Our writer Svetlana Mornets has covered this for the magazine this week. She joins me now with war historian Anthony Beaver. Svetlana, you write for the magazine this week about the Ukrainian army and growing internal disagreements about conscription. Tell us about what's happening between President Zelensky and his top general. First of all, we have ended in the situation when Ukraine is entering the third year of the full-scale war and we, have not, we don't have enough soldiers in our army. So the, our army commander, Zaluzhny, he offered that this year Ukraine has to conscript up to half a million people. While Zelensky said that Ukraine can't afford it because cons conscripting this amount of people will cost at least 10 billion pounds. And it's only for paying their salaries, clothing, food, and equipment, and training. Ukraine can't use the Western aid for paying for soldiers. And also, the, our budget deficit this year is at least 30 billion pounds. So he said Ukraine can't afford this amount. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, right now there are talks that Zelensky wants to fire Zaluzhny and find a new commander-in-chief. And he hopes that the new person will give a fresh start for Ukraine's war effort. You mention in your piece that in the Second World War, the average age of combat was 26. In the Falklands, it was 23. For a Ukrainian soldier, it's 43. I think that's going to surprise a lot of people. A clear decision has been made so far to conscript a slightly older generation to keep the young people uh, at home and, and working and keeping the economy afloat. But is that about to change? Yes, right now, um, before the minimum conscription age was uh, 27. And with the new law, they are going to lower it to 25. And also, also all the men aged from 18 to 24, they will have to undergo uh, a military training for five months. And of course, uh, it is more efficient to have younger people in the army and they can be trained uh, by our Western allies and become drone operators or they can work in intelligence, communication. That's why uh, before it was they conscripted older people because they thought, OK, younger will stay and rebuild the country after the war ends. Antony, as Svetlana has suggested, this is miles apart from other wars in the way that conscription has taken place. What's the strategy here and how does it compare to the past? Well, it's very different, as she rightly pointed out, between, they say, the Second World War uh, and the Falklands and so forth. Uh, and in many ways, I think it was a, an intelligent move at the beginning. But quite honestly, the pressure of events has actually changed considerably. And I think that Zelensky is not facing up to the facts on the ground. Uh, and I think that Zelushny, General Zelushny is, is, is absolutely right. And if you leave it too long, uh, the crisis is actually going to get far worse. If you start throwing in basically untrained troops at the last moment, uh, you're going to face massive losses because it's not just a question of the training. It's a question of how you introduce these young recruits uh, or much younger recruits into the front line. And what they must do is learn from the terrible mistakes made by the British and the Americans in Normandy, uh, where these soldiers were thrown forward uh, and unprepared, and most of them had psychological breakdowns. The casualties in their first few days uh, were terrible. And the established troops, the trained troops, who were the vital ones, didn't want to have anything to do with the young ones who were arriving. Uh, they basically shunned them, which made the situation even worse. So it is terribly important, as I say, uh, to have mentors who will look after them in their first few days in, contact, uh, in combat. Uh, and I think this is the real lesson that uh, basically Ukraine should learn from our mistakes in the Second World War. Mm. Anthony, what do you make about that point about spending £10 billion pounds is a lot of money in the UK, but in a country like Ukraine, I think that amounts to roughly a, a quarter 
of, of government spending at the moment, seeing as they can't move military aid around easily, how are they going to find the money to bring on these younger recruits? Well, one of the problems is that uh, for various uh, complicated reasons, uh, they cannot use foreign aid in paying troops uh, or they should be able to use be able to equip them all right. Uh, but the point is, I think they're trying to do perhaps too much too quickly. Um, they've got to start doing it. And I think this uh, standoff between Zelensky and Zelensky, uh is, is tragic at this particular moment because uh, this is where some form of compromise has got to be found. Uh, but the economic one is a very, very difficult one. Yes, it's going to cost a lot of money, um, but it's absolutely vital for Ukraine's um, survival. Uh, the issue is that the lack of men on the front line has already started to take a toll on the battlefield. And last week, Russian forces already entered Avdiivka, a city in the Donetsk region that they were trying to capture for a decade. Uh, they also prepared 40,000 troops to try to capture Kupiansk in Kharkiv region, and only 20,000 Ukrainian troops will be there to defend the city. And soldiers I've been talking to uh, who, are, who are preparing for the fight or who are already fighting, all of them say that they need more troops, they need reinforcements, they are tired, they have been fighting for two years and they can't understand why other men, why should, be, why should it be only they or why other men don't join. Mm. Svetlana, how do you, you've spoken there about how the soldiers currently feel. How will Ukrainian families feel when the conscription numbers go up and when their sons, when the younger members of their family are going to be sent to the front line? Of course, nobody wants to go to war, nobody wants to die. It's the decision that Ukrainians and our government have to make or we fight or we talk with Russia. And mm -hmm. at the moment, nobody wants to talk with Russia and all the, our opinion polls show that Ukrainians are not ready for any negotiations because we know what comes after that Russian occupation and all the horrors that it brings. But at the same time, uh, si there is a big gap between civilians and soldiers because civilians were hoping that the war could be won without them, because especially in the first year of this full-scale invasion, Zelensky and our, our government were talking that it's going to be the year of our victory, and it didn't happen, and a lot of pe people feel disappointed because of that. Mm. Anthony, there's increasing pressure on Ukraine from other countries around the world to enter into some kind of conversation with Russia, but we've heard Svetlana's comments there. If that is not considered an option for Ukraine right now, it is an inevitable outcome, isn't it? That more are going to be conscripted. They're going to have to find the money, but we are probably going to see cracks in the current plan as it exists now. Well, I think that uh, Svetlana in her excellent article um, points to many of the uh, problems and the uh, the young, uh, just like the former generation of the or earlier generations in the Second World War, uh, are not just appalled by the prospect of uh, military service, but this this fear of being disfigured or maimed in battle um, is far greater actually than the fear of death. Um, and for example, in the Second World War, soldiers in the Red Army. Um, were terrified of becoming what were known as some of us, i.e. they'd lost all their limbs and they were treated so badly afterwards. So it's not just a question of the money to find and pay and equip new troops. It's also a question of the money uh, to look after the troops, especially those who've been badly wounded and maimed and lost, lost limbs uh, in the fighting. And I think this is one of the uh, big problems which obviously Ukraine is facing. Svetlana, what do you make of increasing pressure on Ukraine to come to the table with Russia and have, an, have a conversation, have a negotiation? I think it is very unfair because first, Ukraine, at the beginning of the invasion, Ukraine didn't receive enough weapons and support uh, to liberate the lands. And recently was revealed that when Russian just Russian just took Melitopol, for example, and Zaluzhny said, okay, we are going to strike Melitopol and we're going to liberate it quickly. The West said, no, you are not allowed to do that because 
we don't want to provoke Putin. And the chance was lost. And when the counteroffensive started and it re didn't reach any goals, it was already too late because Russians prepared, they had the minefields, they have had defense lines ready, so Ukrainians couldn't do anything. And right now, as we couldn't achieve our goals because we didn't have a recover, for example, for our troops, uh, now we are told, okay, we see that you can't liberate lands, then you must talk. And why Ukrainians don't want to talk now is because we are not in the advantageous position for negotiations. We can't set our terms, you know. If we had some victories on the battlefield, maybe then we could say, okay, look, we did this and did this. That's why uh, our terms are like this and you have to comply with them, you know. But right now we can't. And if, if we talk with Russia now, it would be on Russia's terms how it ends. That's why Ukraine is not ready to do that. Mm. Uh, Anthony, last question, almost regardless of what happens in this war next, Zelensky is going to need his most senior politicians and generals in his camp, on his side. And he has talked about a major reset. Should we expect to see some more shakeups in President Zelensky's top team, as there do seem to be increasing disagreements internally in Ukraine? Well, I fear that may well be the case. And I think it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> as I was saying, tragic uh, that it should be coming at such a such a time. Uh, this is though one of the problems in warfare, and especially uh, for a democracy fighting a war. Um, there are always going to be these sort of tensions. Um, but I mean, you've only got to see on the other side, I mean, how many generals have been f sacked by Putin uh, during the earlier part of the war? Uh, because they were not achieving what he had expected or what he had hoped. Um, well, we're starting to see similar pressures now in Ukraine. But I would add one thing also to what Svetlana has just been saying uh, about the problems of negotiations, and that is how can one trust anything that Putin says? Um, this is one of the problems in the past when the West was dealing with communist leaders, either in China or in Russia during the Cold War, on the whole, they could be fairly certain that these communist leaders would uh, stand by their assurances. This cannot be trusted anymore. And this is one of the real fundamental problems about the future of diplomacy, about geopolitics as a whole. Uh, if you cannot in any way trust what they say in negotiations. And let's face it, Putin wants to have, uh, it would like to have a ceasefire for a time while he is bringing in new forces, preparing and uh, uh, basically redeploying his troops. Um, he will then try and find some excuse just to continue the war so he can grab more territory. Um, all of this is, makes any question of negotiation uh, doubly dangerous for Ukraine. I agree with Anthony on that because we had Budapest Memorandum with Russia, we had uh, two Minsk agreements with Russia, and uh, Russia, both of them didn't work. Russia attacked Ukraine. And in 2014, when they invaded uh, Crimea and Donbass, we made that ceasefire. And in eight years, Russia came back with, with stronger forces. And the fear right now is, OK, if we have a deal with Russia and Putin has time to prepare for the next invasion, maybe the next time Kyiv will fall and then it will be over for Ukraine. So while we have this chance that we can uh, protect our lands and ensure that we bring, bring back our territories, we have to use it. Anthony and Svetlana, thanks for joining Spectator TV. And finally, Zoe Strimple has written for Spectator Life this week about the rise of the Thomas Hardy man, men who have lovely things to say to and about women, but in practice are often the worst when it comes to romantic relationships. She joins me now. Zoe, thanks for joining Spectator TV. You write for Spectator Life this week about the rise of the Thomas Hardy guy. Tell us why you've named men after Thomas Hardy and what are they like? Well, they certainly have nothing to do with his writing abilities, um, <laughs> his literary skill and imagination, depth, um, humanity, and the rest of it, which which kind of has, has made him one of my all-time favorite writers and actually poets. And I, I don't even like poetry, but his poetry 
is incredible. And it's also incredible about his late wife. I mean, obviously they're both dead now, but at the time, you know, he wrote these poems about his wife, Emma, and they're amazing. And I think what the, the piece is really about how on one hand you could have this, this man who seems so um, almost feminist, really just the, the kind of streets ahead of his, uh, of his kind of bros, uh, in the 1890s or whatever, in terms of how seriously he takes women, how empathetic he is to women on the page. Um, but then I think the, the point of the piece is to, is to sort of think about, well, that contrasted pretty severely with his um, daily life and approach to the women in his actual life, which involved uh, treating his wife, Emma, pretty badly, making driving her mad, part, part, you know, possibly always going for younger women, even in his 80s, kind of still the women in their 20s, 30s. And it just the point is that today, <laughs> there is a similarity in, in terms of the in terms of men who are like kind of scholars of women in the same way. Um, I mean, less intelligently, as I say, but you know, they, they, they seem to be kind of, you know, like there's this thing, horse whisperers, they're like woman whisperers. Like they understand what women want to hear. They understand how women want to spend their time. They're charming. They seduce you. But these are the ones that often actually end up kind of breaking your heart, treating you um, very callously in the end and leaving you completely confused. And I think the, the sort of slightly wild parallel, um, is that really is that on is this kind of women be wary of that potential split between the man who appears to be really like an ally or whatever you know the word was after me too um and how he's actually going to treat you he may very well end up being the heartbreaker that thomas hardy was um let's pick up on that word ally because in the piece you write about the wary connection that you're making between the men who call themselves feminists and allies and the men who will break your heart. What's going on here? Is it a savior kind of complex? Is this the idea of them actually being desperately wanted by the women that they're claiming to help? Yeah, I think there's an interesting psychological explanation um, that at least applies to some of them, like the Casanova type that I mentioned in the piece, which I had some experience of when I was quite a bit younger. Um, and I think for them, it's almost like it's a game. And I think it often does originate in a, a kind of youth or an adolescence where they felt they were, you know, not physically impotent, but impotent in terms of, you know, their ability to get girlfriends or sex or female interests. So they kind of work out how to snare women. Um, I don't think Thomas Hardy is actually in that same, you know, I don't, I think that's not what's going on for him. I think what's going on for him is just a genuinely interesting split and contradiction that he himself was com confused by as per that quote that I put in the piece, which is, I don't know how, you know, I don't know why I write like that. I don't know why I'm so good at being kind to women on the page and so difficult with them off the page. So yeah, I think, I think it might be a bit different in today's setting possibly who knows i don't actually know the actual inner workings of thomas hardy's mind <laughs> and we don't expect you to zoe we don't expect you to we still like your <laughs> thesis i i suppose we should say at this point probably not all men there are plenty of men out there who will be genuine allies of women but i suppose I, I think some of those people, you know, if, if they really do support women and they respect women, they tend to be a bit quieter about it, right? They show it through their actions rather than their words. Perhaps the ones to look out for are the ones who really want to push this idea on you and, and, ver and vocalize all the time just how much they are an ally of, of women. It's become another tool in their dating box, the, the feminist kit, I suppose, to dating. And, and perhaps that's the problem. People who, who talk about this stuff and who sing the praises of women, but then in their actions don't show it. I mean, I, I actually see that across the board in all sorts of areas. I mean, I, I frankly see that with both genders, especially where, for instance, disdain for capitalism, uh, is expressed constantly, you know, the evils of neoliberalism, the evils of money grubbing and trying to be wealthy. And of course, it's, it ends up being hypocritical. So I don't know, I think I do think the kind of people who feel that they are progressive often engage in a lot of, yeah, it's virtue signaling. And it, it's not always correlated with the genuine 
um, <clears throat> sort of intuitive feel for, for what they say they, they believe. And, you know, some of, as you say, some of the men <clears throat> who I know who are the most, you know, who think it's the most self-evident that, that women deserve the full respect of human beings um, of any kind, you know, they, they, they wouldn't even think to make a politics out of that, you know, that, that just is sort of obvious to them. So I think that's, that's in a way you could take that as a warning sign. I think I suppose it's actually interesting to consider that I don't think Hardy was particularly in a politics of feminism when he was writing this stuff. You know, I think there was a politics of feminism, but I don't think it had people like him in it um, at that point, you know, the suffrage movement and, and what have you. Whereas now things are politicized in a slightly different way. Well, it sounds like Hardy saw opportunity and he was playing probably on the kindness of a lot of these women um, as, uh, as a shot at his opportunity. Um, I suppose we would describe in modern lingo what he was doing is love bombing to some extent and then obviously not delivering on all of his wordy promises um but you know this is a pretty classic example of just being a hypocrite isn't it yes I, and i wouldn't even say he love bombed i think he just it's just the old story where like you wanna you prefer to trade your wife in for your typist or <laughs> you know the typist gets traded in for someone even younger and it's 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 such an old an old trope um rather than necessarily being wordy i think it was just a sort of issue with compulsion and kind of uh, entitlement maybe um and and probably you know gaslighting to use another contemporary term you know my my impression is that his you know wife emma it literally was driven mad by being assumed to be mad so you know she was having these very strong reactions to his sort of so-called friendship with the woman that he was actually in love with so she was kind of right to be feeling like something is not not right here but he was kind of I think making her feel like she she wasn't right to, to feel like that so i think that is one of the that's one of the that's when we get into kind of murkier more subtle terrain of how women are you know slightly kind of c manipulated by by these very clever clever men actually i had a reader get in touch about that piece and say that he thought maybe i was missing the point which was that these kinds of men are just narcissists, you know, and, and obviously love bombing is a classic trait of narcissism. Uh, narcissism is really interesting because everyone's obsessed with it now. It's become like the way to kind of pathologize a certain kind of man. Um, and I, you know, it was interesting that that's the way this person wanted to, to see it. I mean, has there been a sudden kind of growth in narcissists among men? I don't know. Possibly. I don't know either. Maybe we're just getting slightly better at calling it out. But as you say, it's, so. it's a... That, I mean, that's, Kate, just to say, that's key. I think that's a really important point, actually. You know, the, putting the women back into this. Poor old, you know, Emma Hardy definitely wouldn't have had the vocabulary that we have now to sort of call, quote unquote, call out um, Tom or anyone else. And, and we really do. So we have a much more kind of granular grasp of the foul play that goes on in this space. Yep, and on behalf of the women who came before us, we have to call them out now. As you say, it's a tale as old as time, but a very disappointing one at that. Zoe, thank you very much for joining Spectator TV. And that's it for this week. Once again, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week. Thank you.